All right. Good morning. It's an amazing turnout. Are you guys sure you are in the right session, Data Lakes? Yes? OK. Just want to make sure. All right. Um, so I'm Jorge Lopez. I'm a principal specialist within AWS. I've been at AWS for seven years, believe it or not. Um, I'm very lucky to have with me um, Jotsna Karki, uh, Senior Data Engineer at Novo Nordisk. Hi. <laughs> and she's going to be showing us all about their experience building also a, a data lake and a, a multi-data lake architecture at Novo Nordisk. And also here with me is Huey. Hello. He's a senior product manager at the S3 team, right? Yeah. All right. So he's responsible for many of the nice capabilities that you see coming up uh, every year on S3. All right. So awesome. let's get started. Um, so did you know that by making data just 10% more accessible, an average company, a typical Fortune 1000 company, can uh, basically realize an increase in net income of, of about $65 million. So we always hear about data being the most valuable asset for organizations. Uh, so it's nice to put some numbers to it, like the 415% um, uh, ROI uh, or the 48% uh, lower TCO. These are the type of outcomes that a modern data strategy with a data lake uh, on the cloud, especially on AWS, can deliver. So if you want to learn more about how you can make this a reality within your organizations, uh, then yes, you are, you are actually in the right place. Um, so one thing that we have found from talking to customers is that many organizations still struggle to realize value from their data. Uh, they are collecting more data than ever before. But the problem is they still rely on legacy solutions that won't deliver the desired outcomes. And that's not me saying that. There's a lot of uh, consensus with thin analysts. This is just one example from McKinsey. Uh, and the problem is they are stuck with multiple data silos. Um, and they spend the large majority of the time doing things that really add no value, that undifferentiated heavy lifting that Adam was talking about yesterday during the keynote. Right, like the, the building the ETL pipelines. Yes, they are important. They enable a lot of processes, but really th there's no differentiation there, okay? So that's why we see a lot of customers moving away from those data silos into the modern data architecture. Now, um, I know a data lake can mean a lot of different things to different people, so just for this session, I want you to think about a data lake as an architectural approach that allows you to store massive amounts of data into a single repository, a central repository that is readily available to make the data easy to categorize, to process, to prepare for analytics, and then run very sophisticated analytics, including machine learning and AI, on top of it. Now, when I say any amount of data, it's anywhere from structured data, like images, videos, audio files, documents, all the way to structured data, the type of data that you will store on a relational database. Now the question is, what does all of this have to do with uh, business outcomes, or how do you make the relationship between business outcomes and data lakes? And that's a very good question. Um, I think, if you think about it, experimentation drives innovation. Um, if you listen to some of the presentations that we give at Amazon, Amazon is a company that is not afraid of experimenting. And with experimentation comes failure. But the more experiments you can run in less time and at a lower cost, the more you can innovate. And that's exactly what a data lake on the cloud enables you to do. A, database, uh, a data lake on the cloud enables you to run a lot of different experiments. It gives you a very broad set of analytic tools and engines to run any experiment on any type of data. And there are different characteristics that make this possible, but I would like to highlight uh, three of them. The first one is the separation of compute and storage. This is a fundamental shift between 
uh, like from the traditional architectures in which, hey, for those that uh, they had experience with data lakes on Hadoop on-premises, hey, if you need more of either compute and storage, you need to throw an entire box. And then you have to redistribute the data, and it's a very complex process. Then you have to deal with hard hardware failures, et cetera. Uh, and then it's not easy to go up or down in terms of scale. That's very different in the cloud. Number two, you can actually analyze the data. In many cases, you can analyze the data in place without having to build multiple copies of the data. This is very important because it's not just duplicating data. It's all the overhead that comes with that, backups, protection, uh, synchronization of the data. In this model, in many cases, you don't do, have to do that. And lastly, you pay only for what you use. Again, talking about scaling. We have uh, customers, uh, for instance, the financial regulatory agency, that uh, the volume of transactions that they scan uh, varies significantly over time. Like any given day, somebody tweets something crazy and the markets go crazy, right? So um, you need to be able to scale up and down and then just pay for what you use. So over the next uh, 50, 45 minutes, we're going to guide you through this journey. First, how, you, how do you actually build a data lake? How do you move the data into your central repository? Once there, how do you continuously feed uh, the data lake with uh, streaming data, real-time sources, all the different types of sources, right? Once your data is there, how, how do you secure it? How do you manage governance? Uh, who can use the data for what? Uh, what data you can actually collect? Which organizations, for what purposes? Um, how do you manage centralized security for different groups within the organization that can grow up to hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of users? Then we're gonna uh, dive a little bit into performance and cost. Surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, <laughs> Performance are co and cost are very tightly related, right? Many times we find that if a process um, is very expensive, that means there might be a better way to actually accomplish the same task in a much more cost-effective and faster fashion. So we're going to give you some tips uh, that are very useful regardless of where you are on your stage uh, of building the data lake. And last but not least, as I said before, we are very lucky to have here with us uh, Jotsna uh, from Novo Nordisk. They've gone through this journey of building a data lake, and then they are moving now to kind of a data mesh uh, architecture. So it's always nice to, to hear from a real-life example uh, and the lessons that they've learned during that journey. So with that, let me pass it over to Huey um, to talk about the first part. Awesome. Thanks, Jorge. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Huey from the Azure product team. We have a big crowd here, but um, so if there's any sort of S3 features uh, that we couldn't dive into, the details that you want, we'll have our contact information at the end. I'd love to engage with you know, every, and all of you, even after the session. So now we're going to talk about sort of uh, how to conceptualize building your, your data lakes. So the first thing you want to think about when building your data lake is actually where to store your data, the sort of storage layer for your data lakes. And there's a couple dimensions that you want to keep in mind when you decide that storage layer. Uh, to name a few, scalability, uh, securities, and ecosystem integrations, just to name a few. And S3 is a really good solution on all those fronts. Um, Scalability-wise, um, S3 holds right now over 280 trillion objects and average over 100 million requests per second. Um, what that means is that you really want a storage layer that can scale elastically as your daily grows and as your enterprise evolves. Uh, the second is uh, securities. Um, so you want to uh, source solutions that uh, can enhance your sort of security postures as compliance needs sort of evolve over time. And for that, S3 offers a variety of options, which we'll go over in a bit. Uh, on the encryption front, you can do you know, either server-side or client-side encryptions. Uh, on the access control front, you can use IAM, um, you know, whether it was bucket policy or access point policy, and IAM being a very powerful primitive to craft the permissions specific to your needs. And we'll go over that in, in a bit. Um, and the last part is ecosystem integrations. Um, and this is really, really important because 
you know, you're not just storing your data in S3 or in this one of those storage layer. Uh, you want to put the data to work to derive insights to train machine learning models. And to do that, you want a storage layer that really integrate well with other these analytics and machine learning AI services built on top of it. And for that, S3 integrates with a um, variety of AWS services like EMR, SageMakers, uh, Athena, Glue, uh, and also third-party software like Databricks and, and Snowflakes. So with that said, today there's you know, hundreds of thousands of data lakes being built on S3, and we have co uh, customers like BMW, Vanguard, and of course, Novo Nordisk building their data lakes on, on S3, and, and um, we're very excited about that. Now, the second thing, after you've decided sort of where to store data, your storage layer, um, a lot of customers want to think about now how you can transfer your data, how can, you can migrate your data from your existing uh, data source to uh, the storage layer, to S3. And, and we have multiple uh, services here that, that can help you do that. Um, to start off, a lot of customers need to migrate a large amount of data all at once. Um, and for that, we have the AWS Snow Flam family. Uh, which is a collection of physical devices that help you transfer large amount of data uh, offline all at once. So it's really good for that initial migration step. Um, after you've done initial migrations, um, you might want to look into some of the services that help, can help you continuously sync and replicate new data in, from on-premises environment to, uh, to the cloud. And for that, uh, we have uh, AWS Data Syncs, uh, which I uh, highly recommend you guys to look into, which help you do just that, sort of continuously replicate new data from on-premises to the cloud. Um, and you can, also, you can do a, offer uh, different options. You can uh, transfer that either over the internet or uh, via AWS Direct Connect, which is a more sort of performant version if you want sort of a, a more bandwidth. And we also have AWS Transfer Family, uh, which is a, uh, a family of services that help you transfer files in and out of uh, S3 and EFS um, over a you know, variety of protocols like SFTP and FTP. And one, uh, one service is not listed here we want to call out is a, a, a partner that, that we work very closely called WAN Disco. They run this service called uh, Live Data Migrator, which focuses specifically on migrating HDFS and, and metadata catalog. Um, and for a lot of you, you probably know that if you run your data lake on an on, on-premises environment, you probably are using HDFS as your storage layer and running some kind of metadata catalog. And this service is really good uh, to help you focus on migrating that specific piece of your data lakes. And uh, for a lot of customers, after you've done the migrations and, and transferring the, the data from on-premise environment to S3, now you want to think about, a lot of customers want to think about sort of how you can do a hybrid access of data, both on-premises and on the cloud. And for that, we have uh, AWS Storage Gateway. Highly recommend you guys to check it out, um, which gives you on-premise access to data in the cloud. One service we also want to particularly call out is a Database Migration Service, or DMS for short. Uh, we see a lot of customers running many, many databases for their complex software stack. You know, each database can be for a specific micro microservice or a specific developer team. And with the rise of Data Lake, um, a lot of customers want to sync all of these databases into a single centralized data repository. And DMS help you uh, do just that. Uh, it supports a lot of uh, varieties of sources, whether it's relational database or non-relational databases, and, and help you sync all those different databases into uh, your S3 as your sync uh, very, very easily. So at this point, you've decided your storage layer. Yeah, you've done the migrations uh, using all these fantastic services, and both from AWS and our partners. Um, and, and now you want to think about how you can put the data to work. And for that, this is where the ecosystem integration piece comes into place. Um, there's a, AWS has a variety of services, depending on your specific use case and needs and what you want to do with the data. Um, so, but you know, we're not going to go over all of them. And there are specific sessions uh, during this room and that focus on each individual services. So we'll just call out a couple. Um, you can use EMR to run highly scalable ETL jobs. Uh, you can use SageMaker as your one-stop shop for all things uh, machine learning, whether you're doing data explorations or model training or model deployment. You can use Redshift as your high-performing SQL analytics warehousing solutions. So um, depending on what you need, there's, a, there's an AWS service that can, that can uh, help you with that. 
And the last part about setting up your data lake is how, what services you can also use to continuously feed your data lake to enrich the data uh, on your data lake on a sort of automated basis. And for that, we have a variety of services. A couple we want to call out is that uh, for streaming, which a lot of time is for you know, log use cases and real-time use cases. If you want to AWS manage solutions, there, uh, there's Kinesis and MSK. Um, if you want to run your own open source software uh, on a sort of commodity hardware, uh, you can run uh, Kafka or Flink on EC2 or EKS, and we see a lot of large customers uh, do that. Um, and last thing, uh, but not least, we also want to call out is uh, AWS Glue, uh, which is serverless data integration service that make it really easy for you to, um, to sort of set up, a monitor, and run ETL jobs uh, in a serverless fashion so you don't have to worry about the sort of the, 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 the infrastructure management aspect. All right. So at this point, you've set up the big picture of how you, you are setting up your data lake. You've decided the storage layer, uh, how you migrate the data, the, the different services you can put to use to, to analyze the data. Um, the next thing you want to think about is how, what kind of practices, what, what kind of features you can use to enhance your security postures, uh, resiliencies, and implement some kind of data governance. Here is a list of S3 features that uh, we think are really key to keep in mind when you think about sort of securities. Um, on the top, we have uh, uh, IAM, Identity Access Management, uh, which is a very powerful primitive to craft permissions. And within S3, you can express that permissions either via uh, bucket policies, uh, which many of you might be familiar with. Uh, it's a sort of an IAM policy on the bucket level. Um, or access point, which we're going to go over in a bit what it, what it, what it does uh, and it can help in the, in the data lake scenarios. Um, on the encryption front, uh, there's a variety of encryption options, server-side encryption, client-side encryption. Um, and one, one thing about encryption uh, that we want to call out is that we launched this feature called uh, Bucket Key uh, a couple years back. And uh, you can use Bucket Key to reduce your KMS request call by up to 99%. And it does this by uh, caching a bucket level key uh, instead of having one key per, uh, per, one KMS key per objects. And by reusing that, you reusing that bucket level key and reducing the number of requests you call to KMS, it can drastically reduce your, your KMS cost. So bucket key. Um, and another feature I want to call out is the object lambda, which is a compute layer in front of S3 that can process the data on the fly before returning the object to you. In the, uh, in the case of data lakes and security, the use case we see a lot of customers use is use object lambda to redact uh, PII uh, and sensitive information on the objects on the server side before returning the objects to the client. And that eliminate a lot of the, the client side management um, that your developer would you have to, you have to do. Last but not least is object lock versioning, uh, which help you protect against uh, deletions, uh, whether it's meant for accidental deletions or, uh, or malicious deletions. So access points. Um, as mentioned in the last slide, uh, you can use access point to craft IAM policies. And um, the, the use case for access point is really to scale your access control for your uh, buckets. Um, we've seen a lot of customers using this sort of a data lake uh, concept, which are a meaning you have a shared, uh, you have a one centralized repository, you know, for example, one bucket shared by many, many uh, users, applications, and, and teams. And when you do that at scale today, and you try to enforce fine-grained permission, you, know, you, don't want, you don't want all these you know, users and application access, have blanket access to your bucket. You want to uh, narrow down their access. And when you do that at scale today using just bucket policy, you can run into very scaling challenges. So Access Point is here to help you with that. Uh, what it does is that it's a, it's a uh, unique endpoint in front of your bucket. You can create many, many access points in front of your bucket that tailor for you know, one group of users, one applications, one use case, and you have a specific unique uh, policy tailored for that use case. Um, and instead of having these user and application talk to the bucket, you can have them talk to the access points and have the, that unique policies. And what this really allows you to do is scale your access control as your bucket is becoming uh, shared by more and more user and applications. And in July this year, we announced some news for, for exciting news for access points, where now you can uh, create up to 10,000 uh, access points per region and per account. And right now it has better integrations and more integration with other AWS services uh, like Sage, Sage, SageMaker Feature Store, uh, Redshift, and, and CloudFront. So um, 
multi-region feature to enhance resiliencies. We see a lot of customers uh, now who really care a, a lot about um, uh, enhancing their resiliency on, on AWS. You know, in case some of, uh, something happened with their primary regions, um, they want to have a secondary backup in another regions. Um, and for that, uh, there are two key features uh, we, we, we think um, you guys can keep in mind is as to replications and a multi-region access point. Uh, what replication does is a is elastic, fully managed, and cost-effective way to replicate objects uh, across buckets. The use case for, uh, for resiliency is that you can use replications to easily uh, set up a secondary copy uh, in the separate regions from your primary regions uh, for resiliency reasons. And replication is actually one of our most popular features. So over the years, we've shipped many, many enhancements to replications to make it very flexible um, and sort of a la carte. Uh, depending on your, your need, you can set up a replication as you like. And um, so whether you want to use replication to do same region replication, cross-region replication, you know, same account, cross-account from one bucket to multiple bucket, have an SLA, uh, you can use replication to do that. It has different features to, 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 to help you do that. And we recently also announced some news for replications. Uh, right now, uh, replication can support uh, SCCC encrypted objects, uh, which SCCC is encryption type that you provide the key to S3 to encrypt the object for you. With this launch, what it means is that replication can support all encryption type. So regardless of how objects are encrypted, you can use replications to uh, automatically manage the replications uh, for you. Another feature we want to call out is a multi-region access point, which we launched uh, last year. Um, what it is is that it's a unique global host name uh, in front of multiple bucket across different regions. And that really simplifies the sort of multi-region setup and multi-region story for you guys because um, for your application, instead of having the application have to figure out which region, specific region it needs to talk to, they can just talk to this one, uh, one single uh, unique uh, host name, and that's multi-region access point, and have S3 and AWS manage the request routing for you. And behind the scene, um, S3 will route the request to the, the highest performance um, uh, a bucket, so uh, the bucket closest to the, to the requester. So with that said, um, we'll talk about lake formations, and I will like Jorge uh, to talk about lake formation. Thank you, Huey. Uh, so by now, I, you've seen a lot. <laughs> so you might be wondering, like, how, how do I make sense of all of this and, and, and build and govern the kind of the data lake, right? That there's a lot of things that go into that, like managing the permissions, providing a data catalog, just to be able to understand all the data, uh, providing kind of a self-service way of accessing the data and sharing the data. So if you are interested about all those features, then you should really look at Lake Formation. Uh, Lake Formation is a, a key service that will enable you to accelerate all the process of building, managing, and operating your, your uh, data lake. Um, so there could be, again, an entire session on Lake Formation, but uh, I would really like to highlight some of the key features um, just to give you a sense. One of them is Govern Tables. Uh, we introduced this functionality last year at reInvent. And this allows you to uh, provide, well, there, there's actually three aspects to it, right? One is it will allow you to provide database-like functionality within your data lake. Things like ACID transactions, you know, like all the atomicity, consistency, isolation, and uh, durability. Now, as you may know, this is obviously related to transactional databases. So we are providing that type of functionality here with the data lake. When you should think about this? Well, if you have complex data pipelines, if you have real-time streaming data, updating tables constantly, or you need support for transactions, then uh, you really want to think about govern tables. Another key feature is uh, the ability to automatically optimize performance. Uh, what um, the, it's, it's like the automatic compaction, that's what we call it, and that refers to the fact of uh, optimizing the size of your files in order to provide the best uh, query performance. I'll talk about, about that later in the last section, uh, but just keep in mind, lake formation makes it easier to do that. Last but not least, time travel. Uh, you can think of these as a series of versioned tables in S3. 
And what that allows you to do is uh, to go back at a specific point in time, and that is very useful for auditing, or if you wanted to replicate an experiment uh, with a view of the data that happened in the past. Okay, another uh, key um, capability that Lake Formation makes possible is sharing data. Now, if you've been here long enough, you probably have heard people saying, hey, well, the data lake is not really a new construct. Uh, I mean, it's just the new data silo. Well, that might have been true in the past, but now it's not because you can actually share the data. And in this model, you can think of it as uh, producers and consumers of information, right? So the producers get grant permissions to the consumer account, and then the data lake administrator for the consumer account can subsequently grant a, a specific permissions to other users within that account, okay? So what happens in the background is that lake formation will actually create a kind of soft links, if you're familiar with Linux and Unix operating systems. It, it's similar concept. It creates soft links to the actual data sets. So then when you run analytics on those, um, on those uh, data sets, it's completely transparent to the engines, okay? So this kind of model actually enables uh, a, a newer approach that uh, forces you to think of data as a product. Data is no, no longer like a centralized uh, resource that is governed by a central authority and then all the systems and groups within the organization have to fight for <laughs> those resources. No, this is kind of more a federated approach. So uh, some people call it a, a data mesh. Um, a data mesh is defined as the decentralized domain-oriented data architecture to drive uh, govern sharing of data products. So again, is thinking about data as a product, and then uh, you have producers, you have consumers, and uh, each team has its own domain. So for example, in a financial services organization, each line of business uh, can maintain its own data lake, right? And then provide, as part of that, they, they, they build and provide curated data sets that then they can share with different groups within the organization. You can think of these groups as, say, personal banking, business banking, credit cards, investments, and each of them is producing their own data sets that then they share with the rest of the organization. Of course, within uh, uh, a framework of governance, within like following all the compliance um, regulations. Right? Our most sophisticated customers are already moving into this direction. And a perfect example is Novo Nordisk. Uh, Jotsna is gonna talk uh, a little bit more about actually how they, they are transitioning from that kind of monolithic data lake into this multi-lake architecture. Okay, getting now into the performance aspect. As I mentioned, these two, performance and cost, are uh, tightly related. So I'm going to give you some tips. Um, first, uh, a general overview of uh, performance in Amazon S3. There's a session that dives specifically into this topic, an entire session just about performance on S3. Here are some pointers to get you started. Uh, first, as you know, performance is an iterative process. So the recommendation is constantly measure, constantly track the performance, and do adjustments uh, on an ongoing basis, right? Now, in general, you should think of S3 as a distributed system. And in order to get the best throughput from this system, you need to horizontally scale by partitioning your data. The way you do that is by creating prefixes, right? So performance or, or throughput at Amazon S3 is defined by the prefixes and your applications can achieve far bigger performance if you understand this concept. So to give you a sense, in Amazon S3, you can roughly achieve around um, 3,500 puts and 5,500 uh, get requests per second, per prefix, not per bucket, per prefix. So if you create 10 prefixes within your bucket, you multiply that by 10. 
So you could be getting 55,000 um, uh, reads, uh, requests per second if you have 10 prefixes. Uh, number three, I think I'm on number three, right? Uh, optimized file size, yes. So that's the one I was talking about with lake formation. So if you think about it, if you have a lot of small files, then uh, S3 needs to open each file, read the metadata, and then do whatever it needs to do. So a lot of overhead. Uh, usually, the threshold is about 128 megabytes, OK? On the other hand, if you have very large files, then you have a single reader going through the entire file, and it has to wait until you can actually do any work. So you don't want any of those extremes. A very easy way to uh, optimize the size, use lake formation, out of compaction um, functionality. If you don't want to use lake formation or cannot use lake formation, there are other utilities like S3, uh, DIST, uh, CP uh, that you can use to then combine uh, multiple smaller files into uh, fewer larger files. Uh, number four, this is also super important, compression and columnar formats. These two combined will help you get much, much faster performance, significantly faster performance at a much lower cost because you save on storage, okay? So there are multiple columnar formats. Parquet is one of those. Parquet is very popular. So just to give you an example, uh, we ran a test with a specific query on a specific file. So that doesn't mean that applies for everything, but just to give you a sense. Um, the same query using Parquet GZIP uh, ran 30 times faster and had a cost of 99% lower cost than the same query against the same file, but uh, with the data in text, text format. Right? So yes, you can throw any type of data into S3, but you want to be very deliberate in uh, the format that you use to store your data, uh, depending on the use case. Right? Finally, always check for the latest APIs, the latest SDKs. Uh, there are some capabilities that are not as well known. Uh, we need to do a better job uh, on those. One of those could be S3 Select. If you are retrieving a ton of data for uh, certain queries, you may be able to leverage S3 Select, which allows you to pre-filter the data set so that you don't have to scan the entire file and you don't have to then filter on, on that file once you actually have extracted that, okay? So that's another, another area to keep in mind. Okay, uh, another very simple trick, uh, S3 Intelligent Tiering. Uh, this is also a relatively new capability. Um, who here can say that the data that they store has very, very predictable access patterns? Anyone? No? No one? Really? Seriously? No? Okay. Well, for then, for everyone, <laughs> this, is, this is a key capability because what S3 Intelligent Tiering does is it automatically stores the objects in three access tier. A frequent access tier, an infrequent access tier, which uh, has 40% lower cost, and an archive instant access tier that has 68 lower cost than the infrequent access tier, okay? And what it does is that it will store the data depending on the uh, access patterns. So for instance, if you have data that has not been accessed for more than 30 days, it will automatically move it to the infrequent access tier. Now the nice thing about it is, let's suppose that then the next day you run a query uh, that spans data in the infrequent access tier or even the archive instant access tier, then it will automatically move the data to the frequent access tier. There is no performance overhead, no performance hit whatsoever, no retrieval cost. So what that tells me is that it's a no-brainer. You should just use S3 Intelligent Tiering as the default access uh, tier for your uh, storage. And customers are saving a ton of money on that, 250 million saved so far. 
Next, storage lens. Who is familiar with storage lens? S3 storage lens. One, two, three, four, maybe a handful, 10, 15 people. Okay, so we need also to do a much better job on this. This is a capability that we introduced back in 2020. And um, actually, it helps our customers gain a lot of visibility into S3 usage and activity trends uh, down to the bucket and even the prefix level. Uh, we started with, I think, about uh, 30 or so metrics. Uh, two weeks ago, we added more metrics, so now we have a total of 60 plus metrics. And then um, what it does is it analyzes everything in your data, uh, depending on the scope that you define, and then gives you very actionable uh, best practices that you can implement in order to either reduce costs or also protect your data. For example, if it identifies that there's a ton of data in some buckets that, are, that is not encrypted, then it will tell you, hey, you should probably think about encrypting this data. Or if it finds that there's data on S3 standard that hasn't been used for 60 days, it will tell you, hey, this data hasn't been used for 60 days. You may want to save some money and move it to uh, the infrequent access or uh, to an archive tier. Okay? How do you activate it? You just go to the S3 console, uh, select the scope of your analysis, the regions, the accounts, the buckets, and then uh, after two weeks, it will connect enough data so that you can actually get a dashboard, and then in that dashboard, we'll have all the findings and insights uh, for both the cost savings as well as the data protection. Last example before uh, we move on to our customer, um, FSX for Luster. So, don't quote me on this, but not everything is, is a tree, right? There are some applications that use file systems, okay? So uh, FS Export Luster is a um, managed file system powered by Luster, which is one of the most popular high-performance file systems. It provides um, gigabytes per second of throughput, millions of IOPS, sub-millisecond um, latencies, okay? So when would you do, uh, use FSX for Luster? If you have jobs that need, like if you are doing a training of machine learning algorithms, if you need a high performance computing workloads, if you need to run those on data that it's on your data lake, then you can use FSX for Luster. And the way you do it is, you can think of FSX for Luster as a high performance file interface for your, S, your data on S3. So basically you stand it up and FSX for Luster will basically show you all the data that you have in S3 as files. You don't have to worry about moving the data between FSX and S3. So you run your experiment, going back to experimentation, you run your experiment, you get Faster performance, in many cases you can achieve even lower costs when you are uh, doing this type of workloads, like uh, training machine learning algorithms. And then once you're done, you shut it down, everything is persisted on S3, and that's it. You take the learnings, okay? All right, so we talk about a bunch of services. I don't expect you to read everything here. It has very uh, small font. Uh, what we show you are basically building blocks. You can think of them as Lego blocks, right? And you can build a ton of different things. Even a data lake can take very different forms. But this is a blueprint that I think it, it gives you a sense of how you put everything together, right? In most cases, you will have the same layers. You will have your data sources. You will have your ingestion layer with uh, Kafka, with Kinesis. Then your transformation and storage layer with S3, with the uh, uh, data catalog, and then the consumption layer with analytic engines like QuickSight, Athena, Redshift, and so on. And that's it. I'm going to shut up now, and uh, the boring part is over. Now let's uh, have some fun and hear from our customer a real-life example of how they actually put this together. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you. Data has now become a valuable commodity and every organization is hoarding data like never before. But 
have you ever realized that data does not have value on its own, but it depends on how you use it within an organization? Yes? Yes. <laughs> With an exponential growth of data, if you want to make a business impact using that data, you need to make sure that data is not sitting there alone, but it is being used to accelerate business outcome. So the big question here is, how do we bring our data to life? Hello everyone, I am Jyotsna Karki and I'm a data engineer at Novo Nordisk, based in Denmark. I feel honored to represent Novo Nordisk at this AWS reInvent today. Let's begin our presentation by knowing who we are. Novo Nordisk is a leading global healthcare company founded in 1923 and headquartered in Denmark. We are over 48,000 employees across the world coming together to drive the chains to defeat diabetes and other serious chronic diseases like hemophilia, obesity, to name a few, in addition to rare blood and endocrine disorders. We are ambitious and we strive for excellence. So, how do we do that? Like many other companies, we are also running in our own digital transformation journey. And I'm here to tell you the story about data journey we had in our data management and analytics team. Let me tell you one thing. This team does not own the data, but we help other teams to manage their data and use machine learning, AI, and analytics on top of it to provide better patient outcomes. We are committed to bringing our data to life. Now, let's give a look at how our legacy system look like. Whether our data is stored on premise or in the cloud, we had our data stored in silos. Once the data volume kept increasing, what did we do? We added more, depending on the use cases like machine learning, AI, or simply dashboard. We stored duplicate data in multiple places along with the data pipelines and business logic. Then, it became hard for us to have a single source of truth. As a result, it was inefficient to analyze data across these data silos. So, what now? We made our digital strategy to break down these data silos and gain a 360-degree view of our data in order to accelerate business outcome. It is then when we came with our first generation data lake two years ago. We called it Needle, Novo Nordisk Enterprise Data Lake. It is a centralized data lake with more than 2,000 users. It consists of 2.3 petabytes of data. It was purpose-built to support multiple data domains. You might be wondering, what is a data domain? Well, data domain in a Novo Nordisk is a business unit which either produces or consumes data from our data lake. It can have one or more AWS accounts, like this box in the diagram. We delegated the data ownership to these data domains using AWS S3 access points based on user persona like data engineers, data steward, data analyst, etc. It also comes with an integrated data warehouse, which is Amazon Redshift in this case. Being a healthcare company, we are GXP and GDPR compliant. If you are not aware or familiar with the word GXP, it stands for good practices, and, it, and X could uh, stand for production, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, etc. So this totally served our purpose. Our stakeholder was happy that they could ingest and consume the data from our data lake. But the story doesn't end here. Once again, with an ever-growing data volume and increased number of data producers and consumers, it became hard for central data team to manage these large-scale data management analytics requirements. Also, it came with its own challenges. We faced both design pattern and operational challenges. Because they are correlated, I'm gonna just talk about in holistic view. Because our central data lake was built in one AWS account, we quickly hit the service limit on our resources. Since it was user-based access to the data set, it became difficult for us to manage these policy documents. Also, it required central data team to understand each data set from multiple consumers with varying data governance, hence, uh, as it was also uh, built for a specific use case, we couldn't reuse this data across these data domains. Hence, we uh, stored this duplicate data in multiple pipeline accounts, 
And each of these pipeline, uh, pipelines are required to be validated because we work in a controlled environment being a healthcare company. So um, then we also realized that each data domain has their own data engineers and data analysts, and they really need not to rely on central data team to manage their data set. Then we created our architectural vision of data mesh architecture. Our data mesh architecture has four principles. This is really interesting, so follow me through. Our first principle, data as a product. This principle expects each data domain to own and share their data as a product in addition to uh, building application and maintaining digital products. Remember, each of these data domain is a producer of its own data set and consumer of another data set too. Now, they can be connected through an overarching mesh which helps each data domain for data discovery and governance. Hence, our second principle, distributed domain-driven architecture, which scales with increased number of data producer and consumers. But this was not enough. It raised a lot of concern around and got us thinking. For example, what kind of a platforms would we build in order to provide all these data product usability features? How do we enforce governance in a distributed fashion and avoid chaos and many others? But don't worry, we have our third principle, self-serve platform design. So the main purpose here is to empower data domain by hiding uh, high-level complexity behind simpler abstraction and removing friction from their journey to exchange this product as a unit of value. It also frees up data domain team to innovate with data, and that's exactly what we were looking for. It also made us easier to scale out um, data sharing because it supports distributed solutions that are interoperable. Hence, our fourth principle, federated computational governance. It is a data governance operation model that is based on federated decision making and accountability structure with a team that is made up of data domain, data platform, and subject, subject matter experts like legal, compliance, security, etc. It also creates an incentive and accountability which balances agility and autonomy of data domain while respecting to the global conformance, interoperability, and security of the mesh. Now, I would like to highlight that each of these principles complement each other and addresses new challenges that may arise from another. Now that we understood data product, let's give a look at how data product look like in real life scenario within Novo Nordisk. Here you go. So each data domain has their data product and the circle represents the data lake. Now, Using one, uh, one or more data product, we can create new analytical product, which can be shared with another data domain and create a new product out of it. Here are some of the examples, but not limited to. Please do not focus on the text. They are very specific to Novo Nordisk. Here, I would like to highlight that it is valid for multiple entities within Novo Nordisk, be it research and development, product supply chain, or sales and marketing. Using data mesh architecture, it helped us to re reuse data product and share within the organization. So this is our long-term vision, and we are aware that this will keep evolving. That's why we started our data mesh journey with minimal viable product, and we built our next generation data lake with the help of AWS professional services. We called it NED, Novo Nordisk Enterprise Data Hub. I love talking about this product. So our data hub is a distributed data lake, and it has a data marketplace where you can discover data and its metadata. We became wiser this time and use role-based access to the data set. It also comes with an integrated data sharing, which uses AWS Lake Formation. We lowered the bar for data engineers and provided pipeline blueprints, which they can use to quickly orchestrate their data pipeline and focus on business logic. Using our data pipeline blueprints, 
Now, data engineers can build their data pipeline within a day. Impressive, isn't it? Moreover, we provided the automated and distributed infrastructure across all these data domains. Once again, we are GXP and GDPR compliant. Out of many benefits that we got by adopting this next generation data lake, it also unlists many capabilities for us. For example, it helped us to reuse data product across organization, build data lake house where you can plug in and plug out lake uh, warehouse with our data lake and ultimately adopting data mesh architecture. Are you guys eager to know more about this platform? Let's give a deep dive into the AWS services that we use on this platform. Together, we build this data mesh platform where Data Hub admins can create an environment for each data domain. We use AWS CDK, commonly known as infrastructure as a code, in order to bootstrap our business account. In our platform, uh, we, it supports user interface through uh, CloudFront, partly Amazon Cognito for authentication, and Amazon Aurora to manage business rules and data relation across these data domains. Here on the right, you can see multiple data sources, data uh, AWS services that you can uh, we deploy in each business account. We also provided the pipeline blueprint where data engineers can um, plug in and plug out any AWS services by simply using our configuration file and focus on business logic. With no doubt, our data is stored on Amazon S3 where each data domain can manage the lifecycle and encryption policies. So now let's give a look at how data architecture look like inside each of these business account. This is our common data architecture and being a data engineer, this is definitely my favorite slide. So at the bottom, you can see multiple services and pipeline blueprints that we deploy in each account. In our next generation data lake, uh, for data sharing functionality across this data domain, it utilizes AWS lake formation um, that uh, in order to define granular um, data policies through a grant revoke permission model. Also at the top, you can see multiple steps that our data goes through. One thing I wanted to mention is whether it's a centralized or distributed data lake, this design pattern has always worked for us. So here, what can we see? In the sources, it can be anything like on-premise, um, external, public, first party, you name it. Now, you, using multiple AWS services, you can uh, ingest this data into our data lake. For example, we used um, Amazon FSx uh, for Luster in order to run our large and complex simulation on HPC for protein foldings in research and development. We use AWS Data Sync in order to migrate our on-premise data to, to the cloud. Now, once data is ingested into our data lake, we can use multiple AWS services in order to transform our data. For example, we use AWS Glue in order to convert our large number of CSV files into Parquet in order to optimize query performance and curate the data based on business logic. Now, this curated data can be ingested back into the data lake. Uh, which is GXP compliant. It can also handle personal, finance critical, and strictly confidential data. And now here comes my favorite part. On the data, on the, uh, data load event of a raw data in a producer account, multiple consumer accounts are notified. And then we run AWS Athena query for data modeling and store only curated data in their own account. Now, this help us that we need not to copy the raw data into multiple accounts and have a single source of truth. And also, this helped us to um, re resolve this data integrity issue that we previously had. Now, each data domain can serve this uh, data using Data Lake House, and this can be done using Athena, Redshift in AWS, and we also use other cloud provider services within Novo Nordisk. Ultimately, our end users who are data analysts or data scientists can use their preferred tools in order to analyze this data and generate business value. This showed us that 
data does not have value on its own, but it depends on how you use it within an organization. That's why it is utmost important for a data domain to mostly focus on it. Now that you learned all the technical details about our data lake, you might be wondering, did this really make a difference to our business? Of course it did. Let's give a look at the moment of realization by our senior director after using our data and analytics ecosystem. He says what he thought would take one year has happened in the matter of four days. Impressive, isn't it? Initially, he thought uh, it would take 12 months to load their uh, data into Data Lake, connect to an analytical platform, and derive analytical use case from idea to insights. So yes, here we have it. Our success stories span across multiple entities within Novo Nordisk. I would like to highlight a few of them here. In R&D, we are helping them to scale the number of research candidates and reduce the research lead time by leveraging in silico laboratories and identify high-risk groups. In manufacturing, we are helping them to reduce waste by increasing the quality and optimizing the process. In fact, in one of the projects, we help them to identify vials with defects effectively, count these vials efficiently, and reduce false reject by using machine learning models like deep neural networks. In uh, sales, we are helping team to improve commercial performance by using statistical analysis like market mix model and help business invest into the most promising uh, marketing channels. Similarly, in uh, distribution, we are helping them to uh, optimize the process to distribute our end product uh, uh, for a given, by using right means of uh, transport for a given area, uh, and ultimately reducing the waste and environmental impact. And this is how we are bringing our data to life. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are out of time, but we are, we'll mingle around a little bit just to, just to answer questions that you may have. Uh, please, please, please don't forget to fill out the survey. Uh, that's the way we can improve the events and, and improve the sessions. So thanks a lot for sticking around and enjoy the rest of the event.